Thank you so much, Stacey. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, I want to thank you, Barry, Open Markets Institute. I want to thank Open Book. Uh, it's an extraordinary place. Um, I feel lucky to be here. And I want to thank my antitrust advisors, uh, uh, Max Miller, Catherine Sanchez, Bryce Tuttle, and Kate Conlow. I feel lucky to have all of you on my team. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? All right. Um, uh, before I'll start, I, I want to offer the standard disclaimer that uh, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for the commission or any other commissioner. So uh, as Stacy mentioned, the president nominated me for this position roughly a year ago today. And I spent a good bit of that time reading uh, antitrust treatises cover to cover. And doing that, I quickly read that the purpose of antitrust is to maximize efficiency. I read that the Supreme Court declared it axiomatic that the antitrust laws were passed to protect competition, not competitors, which is a way of saying that antitrust laws are not intended to protect the small and allegedly inefficient. But I also used that time to read a lot of history, which told a very different story. I read that small farmers were responsible for pressing Iowa to pass the nation's first antitrust law in 1888. I learned that when Congress convened in 1890 to debate the Sherman Act, they did not talk about efficiency. No, the most common complaint in the Sherman Act debates was that a cartel of meat packers was cheating cattlemen out of fair prices for their livestock. In 1936, Congress spent months debating a bill to protect small town grocers being driven out of business by powerful chain stores who got secret payoffs from their suppliers. What are we trying to get away from these chains? Said one of the bill's supporters. What we are trying to take away from them is secret discounts, secret rebates, and secret advertising allowances. We are trying to take away from them those practices that are unfair. But if you read history, you'll see that it wasn't just 1890 or 1936. Five times in 60 years, 1890, 1914, twice in 1914, 1936, 1950, Congress passed antitrust laws that in letter or spirit demanded fairness for small business and often rural small business. Yet today it is axiomatic that antitrust does not protect small business and that the lodestar of antitrust is not fairness but efficiency. How did this happen? What does this mean, this focus on efficiency mean for rural America? What has it meant for rural America? And what would it look like to return to fairness? That is what I'd like to talk with you about today. I'd love to start with healthcare. So uh, in a lot of parts of rural America, independent pharmacies are the one place where you can fill your prescriptions, get your shots, and get answers to medical questions. Here's a story I read on the website of the West Virginia Insurance Commissioner about something that happened at one of those independent pharmacies. So a family walks into a, ph a pharmacy, their child has cancer. The pharmacist has the child's medicine behind the counter ready to dispense. But when that pharmacist calls the pharmacy benefit manager or PBM for the family's insurance company, they are denied authorization to give the family that medicine. Instead, they are told that the medicine can only be dispensed by the PBM's own mail order specialty pharmacy. The family was to go home and wait up to two weeks to receive the medicine for their sick child in the mail. How did this happen? Picture a set of 39 companies, some insurers, some PBMs, some pharmacies, 39 of them in total. 20 years ago, these were all separate companies. Today, those 39 companies have merged into just three vertically integrated entities. And so today, when most people fill a prescription, just one of those three vertically integrated entities mediates the medicine they get, how much they pay for it, and how they'll get it. And that corporate entity profits by making sure that prescription is filled by its own pharmacy even apparently when that's cancer medicine and even apparently when it will take up to two weeks for a child to get it. How did this happen? This changed from 39 companies into just three. 
Well, merging companies usually predict that they're going to save money by merging. They then predict that they will pass on those predicted savings onto consumers via lower prices. But for years, it was not a mainstream idea that those predicted price reductions could offset the harm of a merger that increases market power. And that started to change in the 1970s and 80s. The idea took hold within enforcement agencies that mergers, particularly vertical ones, were presumptively good for the economy and good for consumers. This idea was given the greatest weight for vertical mergers, the kind of mergers that help make it so that a pharmacy middleman has an interest in steering a patient to their own pharmacy and not the one they're standing in. Look, there's certainly a lot of factors in merger analysis, but it is inescapable that this presumption of efficiency significantly contributed to making 39 separate companies into the three vertically integrated firms that exist today. And today, rural independent pharmacies are closing one after another after another. And just right here in Minnesota from 2003 to 2018, over 15 years, 30 rural zip codes lost their only pharmacy. I was in Des Moines last month for a conference and uh, I asked our team to set up a listening session with some cattlemen and corn growers. It was about nine or ten people. Every single one of them was in crisis. The prices of seeds, fertilizer, farm equipment, feed were all going up and the prices of their products were going down. Farmers used to make 40 cents on every dollar spent at the grocery. Now they make about 16. They are going out of business by the thousands. We have a noose around our necks and we're standing on an ice cube, said one of them. Another said, it's like being picked apart by a chicken. The group talked a lot about different factors that were behind these changes, but they kept returning and coming back to consolidation. Again, fertilizer, seeds, grain buying, meat packing. There used to be dozens of firms, sometimes over a hundred in each of these sectors, and now each is dominated by just four. And uh, depending on the region, there may now be just one supplier of a key input or just one accessible meat packing plant. What's it like to be down to just one place to sell your livestock? We've known since 1890 that it can depress prices uh, that farmers get. But it's more than that. One of the cattlemen described through tears how he had to gas a warehouse full of cattle when the one processing plant available to him was shut down because of COVID. He said he had, he said he had to hire high school kids to drag out the cattle after that. Another described animal abuse on the lot that he said was unheard of in competitive markets. But maybe the most shocking thing was how scared they were that something they said that day to me would somehow get back to their suppliers or their purchasers and that they would pay for it. How did this happen? The merger wave began in the 1980s and tellingly when farmers have raised alarm about this consolidation, economists have answered that the consolidation quote unquestionably enhances efficiency, close quote. When antitrust was guided by fairness, these farmers' families had good lives. They were part of a thriving middle class in rural America. And after that shift to efficiency, their livelihoods began to disappear. That shift didn't just affect farmers. It also affected the communities that depend on them and their products. Like independent pharmacies, independent grocers often serve places that bigger companies don't. Lower the income, lower the population of any given community, the more likely it is to be served by an independent grocer. I recently watched video testimony of Mr. R.F. Bowie, who is joining us here today. Uh, Mr. Bowie owns 21 stores in South Dakota, uh, and all of them are in Indian country. Mr. Bowie's family has been serving Indian country for 117 years. Many of his stores are the only place where locals can get fresh milk or fresh produce, and many of them are over an hour's drive from the nearest big box store. But Mr. Bowie faces challenges that a lot of his big box competitors do not. First of all, suppliers sell products to the big box stores in sizes and in packages that they don't offer to him. And when he is offered the same products, he cannot get the same prices for them, and that is not because of quantity. 
which is often what you hear. Yes, not the same prices, but it's not the same quantity. Like most independent grocers, Mr. Bowie works with a wholesaler who bundles the orders of lots of people like him, lots of independent grocers. And by doing that, the wholesaler can often meet the order sizes of the big box stores. But even then, his wholesaler is not given the same price. That price is kept secret. When the pandemic hit, manufacturers cut supplies to Mr. Bowie and his wholesaler. Picture this, please, he told Congress. Pine Ridge, one of the poorest counties in this nation, not having WIC items like baby formula on their grocery store shelf. The only way Mr. Bowie could keep these kinds of products on his shelves, products like baby formula, Pedialyte, ground beef, was by shuttling them two times a week. This is a round trip about 1,000 miles, over 1,000 miles each week, from his low-volume stores to his high-volume stores. And yet, when Mr. Bowie would walk into a big box store 50 or 100 miles from his own, those shelves would be full of those exact same products. What's happening to Mr. Bowie is happening to independent grocers across the country. They are closing by the thousand, creating food deserts across rural America. How did this happen? Efficiency happened. In 1936, Congress passed the Robinson-Patman Act. That was the law I was talking about earlier that banned, quote, unfair practices like secret discounts, secret rebates, available only to the large and powerful. When it passed that law, Congress went out of its way to say over and over and over they were trying to, quote, keep open the door of opportunity for the small businessman as well as the large. They use that language over and over again. Fairness, equal opportunity, level playing field. For decades, Robinson Patman was a mainstay of FTC enforcement. It was literally called the Magna Carta of small business. And it arguably prohibits many of the things that Mr. Bowie has experienced. Perhaps not all, but many of them. Then as efficiency gained ground in the mid-1980s, a view took hold first among enforcers and then the courts. First, that Robinson Patman was an outlier among antitrust statutes because the Congress that passed it focused on harms to supposedly inefficient small business over those of consumers. And second, the view took hold that the law raised prices for consumers. Enforcement slowed to a trickle and then stopped entirely. And this was decades ago. From everything our team can tell, those twin claims are either unproven or demonstrably incorrect. To my knowledge, some 86 years after its passage in 1936, there is not one empirical analysis actually proving, actually showing that Robbins and Patman raised prices for consumers. Not one. And none other than Professor Herbert Hovenkamp has explained that Robbins and Patman, when it came to legislative history, was not an outlier. According to him, the congressional debates around each of the other major antitrust laws was also, quote, fairly dominated by a strong desire to protect small business. Now, in fairness uh, to Professor Hovenkamp, he came to a different conclusion from that observation, uh, but that was the observation nonetheless. I think it's time to take a step back and ask ourselves about the role of efficiency in modern antitrust enforcement. If efficiency is so important in antitrust, then why doesn't that word, efficiency, appear anywhere in the antitrust statutes that Congress actually wrote and actually passed? If efficiency is the goal of antitrust, then why am I charged by statute, by law, with stopping unfair methods of competition and not inefficient ones? We cannot let a principle that Congress never wrote into law to trump a principle that Congress made a core feature of that law. I think it's time to return to fairness. And we should return to fairness because people may not know what's efficient, but they know what is fair. It may be efficient to send a child home to wait two weeks for their cancer medicine. We all know it isn't fair. It may be efficient to force cattlemen to sell their livestock to just one meat packer. It may be efficient for Pine Ridge to go without baby formula. We all know that that is not what fair markets look like. This visceral understanding of fairness underlies a lot of American law. Arguably, it underlies the bulk of it. 
but it has been dismissed as ambiguous and impressionistic. I disagree because Congress and the courts have told us over and over, directly and repeatedly, that we should implement protections against unfairness in how to do that. Certain laws that were clearly passed under what we could call an unfairness mandate, laws like Robinson-Patman, directly spell out specific legal prohibitions. Congress's intent in those laws is there, it is clear, we should enforce them. But Congress did more than that. As Chair Kahn explained last week at Fordham, Congress deliberately charged our commission, the Federal Trade Commission, with going beyond the limits of the Sherman Act. And then the Supreme Court came in and repeatedly reaffirmed the idea that our Section 5 authority goes beyond Sherman. And so I support Chair Kahn's goal to reactivate enforcement under our unfairness authority and to issue a policy statement setting out the meets and bounds of that authority. As for me, my focus is on people living paycheck to paycheck. I want to help people with their groceries, their prescriptions, and their paychecks. And I want to make sure we do not leave behind rural America. Thank you very much.